Welcome to season two of No Script, No Problem here on the Believe Podcast Network, the number one podcast network for professionals. Do you believe No Script, No Problem is the show that takes you behind the curtain of unscripted television like never before with insight from some of the best in the business of reality TV, documentary series, competition shows, social experiment, true crime, and much more from Bar Rescue to The Bachelor to The Real Housewives of Atlanta. If it's unscripted, we'll get into it. I'm your host, Steve Berkowitz. I'm a 15-year veteran producer of unscripted television with shows like Extreme Makeover Home Edition, BattleBots, Outdaughtered, The Rachel Zoe Project, and Friday Night Tykes among my credits. Each episode, I talk to the talented people who make unscripted TV, documentaries, true crime, and game shows not just something you watch, but a cultural phenomenon. Now, if you enjoy No Script, No Problem, please subscribe, download, and rate the show. It's available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, Stitcher, Luminary, and TuneIn. You can also find it on Believe.com and at Believe Podcast. You'll follow me on Twitter at Steve Berkowitz and on Instagram at Steve M. Berkowitz. If you're interested in advertising on the show, please contact Believe at Believe.com. All right, let's get started. My first guest is the one and only Carlos King. He is the CEO of Kingdom Reign Entertainment. Shows like Styling Hollywood, Hollywood Divas, Love and Marriage Huntsville, Behind Every Man, and he's got a new show coming up, Bell Collective on OWN. I'm really psyched to have you on the show. All right, now most people would do the chit chat and then talk about Bell Collective, not me. I want to jump right in because we're we're coming up this week, right? We've got the we got the premiere. Um, so Bell Collective, Jackson, Mississippi. This is right up your alley. This is DocuSoap, female. This is own. Why don't you just tell the audience all about Bell Collective? What can they look forward to? Bell Collective is the answer to what it is as it relates to a new female ensemble show in 2021. We've seen Housewives. We've seen Love and Hip Hop. We've seen... We've seen different iterations of a female ensemble. I've been fortunate enough to do many seasons of Atlanta Housewives in New Jersey. This is my answer to five entrepreneurs who live in a city that some people are like, Jackson, Mississippi? What's down there, right? And Steve, what's down there in Jackson, Mississippi is a group of beautiful, dynamic, powerful, Some are millionaires, entrepreneurs who are living and thriving in the city. It's a beautiful introduction to the new South. And these women that I've cast represent that notion. So tell me about what you mean by the new South, because, you know, I've seen you talk on social media about and you, you call it that the new South. What do you mean by that? It's the new South because it no longer is the place that you thought of when you heard Jackson, Mississippi. The Confederate flag just got taken down last year. It's about time. About time, right? In 2020, the Confederate flag was still up. That's, That's just insane. Yeah. No longer are Black women the maids. No longer are Black women just behind their white bosses. These women represent the new South, which is redefining what it is to be a black woman in this city. They're owning businesses. They're owning their careers. They're making their own money. These women aren't relying on a man to make their money. And that's the beauty of this ensemble is the beauty of this show because I get a chance to show the world exactly what it takes to be in Jackson in 2021 and how you don't have to be in a large metropolitan to be successful. Tell me a little bit about Jackson, the, the, the setting of this, of this docu-soap. What's interesting is Jackson, Mississippi reminds me a lot of Atlanta, Georgia. When I started doing Housewives of Atlanta, I was so surprised to see this, the, the Black Mecca, Black entrepreneurs, really living and thriving in the city. It's a, Jackson is a fast city. It's not as slow as people may think it is. They have nightclubs, they have these fancy restaurants. 
Um, they have, you know, the big brand stores. Um, they have everything these big cities have. And the beauty of Jackson is the fact that I was so happy to be there and I did not want to leave because I wanted to explore more of it. And the fact that they have these big mansions, it, I'm telling you, it, it, was, it was very shocking to see in a good way. And again, if I had to compare another city to Jackson, it would definitely be Atlanta. That, that's surprising, but th that, that's really interesting to me. Um, all right, like any good docu-soap, it all comes down to the cast. What can you tell me about your cast? I know you're excited, you got the big smile. Tell me about the cast. This cast is Taylor made for television. They are ferocious, they're funny, they're shady, um, but they're also very real. They have heart, they have soul. Uh, they have this sense of commitment to really making sure that Jackson is put on the map in the right way. These women are all, like I said, entrepreneurs. So they're bosses. And when you're a boss, you know, you mean what you say and you say what you mean. And sometimes that, that causes a conflict amongst the collective, hence Bell Collective. Um, but it's, it's, it's a dynamic force of women who really do respect each other. And they're not putting down each other for the sake of it being a sport. Other ensemble shows that feature women, it is a sport. How can I tear you down? How can I do it the best with my comedy, with my shtick? Like that's the, 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 the entry point into the series. This one is more about how can we come together? There, there'll be bumps on the road, but at the end of the day, it's a sisterhood. How do you find that balance? between the drama, between that conflict, but also the heart, the humor. How do you do that? You know, the biggest thing, Steve, is it's all about the casting. I am so maniacal when it comes to the casting process because I don't look for women who are shit starters. You know, you gotta stay away from that. Um, if they see that, again, as a sport, I have no interest. I look for women who are multidimensional, right? I want to make sure you have the heart and the soul for the comedy chops, but you also can stand your ground and, and, and debate, and debate in a smart way without getting physical. So for me, that's what I want to do in my new position as a company owner and providing content for my audience. I want to make sure that I have the responsibility to really show the other side of what it's like to be in front of the camera. Yes, will it be messy and crazy and all that? Sure. But the reason why so many people take interest in my work is because there's a sophistication to it. There's a smartness to it in the midst of the drama and the shade and all that stuff. And that's really what has been my recipe for success. And you're having a lot of success at home. Uh, three, to my knowledge, three shows on the network. Uh, tell me a little bit about why you feel so comfortable with OWN and why OWN feels so comfortable with you. It's funny, Steve. A lot of people think I'm exclusive to OWN. <laughs> hey, and, word for all the network execs listening, he's not. And listen, the thing is, I love working with them. I love the Oprah Winfrey Network. They're, they understand my shows. They buy my shows. Listen, you get it, Steve. Our job yeah. is to pitch. I pitch to everybody around the world. OWN has bought multiple shows from me. And others have since we last talked, which I'm appreciative of, <laughs> but the beauty of working for the Oprah Winfrey Network is because we're both aligned with the messaging of the shows we want to do. I want to continue working and creating and producing shows about Black women in, in a great light and Black men, men as well. I also want to do that in, in the other genres and, and cultures of our society. And because OWN has been so wonderful to me, they, they've given this 
black production company its start in producing a lot of content for them. You know, TV One did that for me back in 2013 when Hollywood Divas launched. Um, it's not lost on me that two black networks, right, giving me a push sure. and have been supportive. And because other networks have seen like, oh, he has a lot of shows on here and the shows rate well, and they're, they're talked about, they're good. Maybe we need to, you know, see what he has up his sleeve for us. And, you know, my hope is to continue to develop our own, honestly, Steve forever. I, I love working with them. They're a great group of executives where we have the same mission. And, and, and I appreciate and love and respect them so much. You've developed a following, not just, you know, networks that like you, but you have fans. Like you, the, the, the article about uh, Bell Collective was like, Carlos King does it again. Not like, oh, new, you know, new docu-soap from own. It was about you. And I, I thought to myself, I was like, okay, one, that's great that, a, that an unscripted producer is in the headline. Because the only other producer that I could think of was Mark Burnett that really gets that level of credit. So I, I guess I wanted to ask you, like, do you, how do you feel about that? Like really being, you know, the face of a, of a project? It, it's what I talked about earlier in terms of having this responsibility, right? I can't hide behind my work. That's, that's out the door. You know, anything I put out there and my name is attached to it, there, there's a certain level of interest that the audience has an expectation, right? Which is why I am across all of my shows. There's not one show that airs that I haven't seen 25 times. And Steve, you know this, count how many CEOs of production companies actually watch yeah. the shows on yeah. the air. How many of them actually take time out to look at a rough cut? Steve, I watch every single rough cut. By the time it gets a fine cut, I'm like, okay, it's, 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 it's done. You know, like, go ahead, lock it, or fine cut two, do what you gotta do. Because I know that if the show sucks, they're not gonna talk about the cast, they're not gonna yeah. talk about the network, they're gonna talk about me. So I need to make sure that I'm represented, my work is represented, and that the show itself is represented. It's challenging, right? When you are a producer and you're the face of your shows because you also open up yourself to criticism. Yeah. So what the stuff that people say about me on Twitter who don't like my work or don't like me for whatever reason, um, it can affect you if you don't have the the bones to deal you with it. Thick skin. You have yeah. to have thick skin. And I didn't have it. I'm not gonna lie to you. I didn't have that at the beginning because we're we're producers. Yeah. And I what's mean, funny. Yeah. Yeah. And you know we working didn't with sign reality. up. Yeah, we didn't really think about that, right? No. And our job was to always tell the reality stars, don't look at Twitter, don't read the comments, do yourself a favor. And here I am a producer like, wait, what are you saying about me? So I take the good with the bad. It's, it, listen, it's, 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 it's more good than bad, to be honest with you. And last but not least, my audience means the world to me. And the reason why I take the stress <laughs> of being across all of my shows is because I need that responsibility. Because yeah. again, we know a lot of CEOs don't even know what show is on the air that has oh, yeah. name on it. Oh yeah, yeah. I want to get back to Bell Collective really quickly. I heard that this project developed out of literally just a meeting, right? Like it, it was one of those kind of stories where somebody just came in and and it the you know the ball started to get rolling. And so, tell me a little bit about the development process with Bell Collective. So I have a consultation where. If you sign up and pay a fee, you're able to pitch me a show idea. Anybody. As producers, we know that 
we're kind of in a bubble, right? Like we're, we're yeah. kind of in a bubble. I don't know what's happening in Huntsville, Alabama. I have no idea what's happening in Jackson, Mississippi. So it allows everybody in the world to sign up, pay a fee and pitch me a show idea. Some ideas are great. Some ideas are not. Sure. We're producers sure. and some never feel like Carlos, this idea sucks. I'm like, I liked it, but okay, it's not for you. <laughs> so Bell Collective came out of a consultation that someone paid to pitch me the idea of doing a show about a women's brunch in Jackson. And I was intrigued. And I said, okay, find me these type of people who, who live there. Find me these couples or these women. And they did. And the moment I saw them on tape, I said, we have a show here. And I pitched to Own and Own was interested. And we shot a presentation, which for your audience, you may not know, a presentation is like a pilot episode that gives you an idea of what a series will look like. It sets the tone. You get a chance to see can these cast members um, translate on camera. And it's the backdrop of good space to be in. And Own was into it. And it's Miss Winfrey's home state. So I wanted to make sure to do her proud. <laughs> and, little, little pressure there, yeah. You know, a, a little, a little. Um, but the network is so behind you. They love the show. They love the cast. And I'm just happy to have their, their, their support in this. You were able to stay successful and to develop over the course of 2020, which was really challenging for a lot of people, myself included. It was tough to, to develop. Can you talk a little bit about how you and your team were able to kind of keep the shows churning uh, during 2020? And now really, still we're still in the pandemic. How are you doing it in 2021? A lot of it had to do with how do we make a show safe in, in, in a safe environment and how can we do it to where maybe it's in the comfort of people's homes. Behind Every Man is a show that came out of a show I developed uh, maybe three years ago um, with a friend of mine named Courtney Parker and the show is about um, the, the women behind successful men. I pitched that to own because I said, look, I can ship the camera to the celebrity's home. They all have assistants or a team. They can help set up and thank God for technology. We're able to record everything in the comfort of our own homes, the producers, the directors and all that. And shows like that were definitely more appealing to networks. Jackson was sold um, in 2019. Um, we were scheduled to shoot that early 2020, uh, but we pushed it back when the summer we saw the cases kind of go down, you know, go down, right. and yeah. more productions were happening in in the south. I would say. Uh, but we were able to, of course, test everybody and do all those things. Sure. So the biggest thing, it, Steve, is developing shows that is safely made in the comfort of a home or a bubble, whether it's a house reality show or a studio-based show. Those are the ones that's going to get these networks' attention at this point until yeah. everyone gets vaccinated. Yes. Behind Every Man. It's a great concept that does work for OWN because every guy does have a woman or women who have helped them get there. Tell us a little bit about um, this project and where it stemmed from and uh, some of the people who, who are on the show and who you've enjoyed working with. Yeah, Behind Every Man came to me from a producer friend of mine named Courtney Parker. She was the co-EP of Hollywood Divas, The Next 15. And she pitched me this idea three years ago. And I was like, this is very interesting. Long story short, um, I revived it um, during the pandemic because I felt that it was a proof of concept that can be shot in a COVID friendly environment. The show is about women behind successful men, whether it's a wife, a mom, or a sister. Um, and it's sort of a biographical, exploration into the woman's life and it's the man 
um, giving the wife her just due as to his success and the, his, his own legacy that if it was not for this woman, whether it's my wife or my mom, I would not be this superstar that I am today. And we've had everybody on from Usher Raymond and his mother, Jonetta, Kirk Franklin and his wife, Tammy Franklin, Neo and his wife, Crystal. Um, we've had Wyclef John and his wife, Claudinette. And we had DJ Envy and his wife, Gia. And people have really responded to it. And it's been um, a success at OWN. And we have more episodes launching at the end of the month. Nice. That one feels like something that can go for a long, you know, for a long time. <laughs> I want that to be a staple, like I'm how each how each you Hollywood story can just like do a bazillion episodes for the end of time. I want Behind Every Band to be that for the own network for sure. I'm putting it out there in the universe for you, buddy. Thank you, Steve. <laughs> okay. um, so I want to talk a little bit about your style, right? Because you have kind of really found a nice way, you know, like there is a Carlos King style of doing shows that you've developed this fan base. When you start a show or when you're developing a project, what do you tell your showrunners? Can that you were a showrunner, now you've got your own company. What That's is a good that, question. What is that touch? What is that style that you say, look, this is what I want? Like, what is it now that you're kind of passing on to the people who work for you now that you're not there every single day? That's my favorite question. No one has ever asked me that question. And one thing you know, Steve, as a producer, no shock, we are very sensitive about our work, very. right? Yes. We're collaborators, but we, you know, we don't like being told yeah. what to do really. <laughs> so I'm, I used to be a showrunner. I know what it's like to speak to your VP of programming or development or whatever yeah. and give you notes. I try to be very sensitive to that with my showrunners. I do have a style. Carlos King has a brand and there's a certain expectation that my audience has. I am at the front line when we're hiring showrunners for my, my, my shows because I need to know that you're able to make a show based on my style and that you're not gonna get offended when I tell you like, try to do this more and this less, you know, whatever. I've been fortunate enough to have a great relationship with my showrunners. The biggest thing, Steve, is the showrunners who I've worked with Number one, they do respect me and, and they respect my opinion. And even when they're, which, which by the way, I embrace. When there's a little back and forth, shocker people, my showrunners don't just kiss my ass and say, whatever you say, go boss. They, if they believe in something, they'll say, I disagree with you. And I'm like, okay, well, let's have a conversation. And I, I, I concede sometimes if it makes sense. I'm a producer, so I understand that you may know more than I do because you're actually with the cast in the field. It's a difference. So the beauty of my field showrunners and my post showrunners, because you need both to have your vision, yep. is I hire those who are welcoming to a collaboration. Yeah. I'm not here to tell you how to do your job because you are experienced, but I am here to tell you, hey, for these type of shows, this is the expectation. Um, I'll let you know that going into the show and it's your job to make sure you follow suit. I like that. I like that. Um, good, good question, by the way. <laughs> I wanted to ask you about kind of where we are at in terms of reality television and unscripted, because mm -hmm. you're a guy like me who follows kind of where, where we're headed. And, you know, you got the Kardashians now who are headed to Hulu. Mm -hmm. um, how do you feel like, I, I personally feel like the, our industry adapted well in 2020 to the pandemic um, and that we're kind of going in, in a good direction, but with all the streamers, you know, you got multiple streamers now and things are kind of, 
exploding, you know, in terms of the amount of content, are you feeling good about where our industry is headed? What, what are you excited about? And also what maybe are you nervous about or what worries you about our industry? It's a tough question, but. No, no, it's, a, it's a, a, another good question. I don't have any worries. I'll start there. It's a great time to be in unscripted. When this pandemic happened, the scripted world had to take a really strong pause, yeah. right? Um, because that genre of television is big on, you know, huge sets. Yeah. Crew and the yeah. multiple, multiple, multiple people, and your actors are in intimate sex yeah, scenes and kissing, right. and it's there's no social distancing. And 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 unscripted, a lot of shows embraced the pandemic and made it a part of the storyline. Yeah. Um. So for unscripted, I don't have any nervousness. You know, right now. Um, it's a great time to be a, an, a, an unscripted producer because we, like you said, we've proven that this is a solid proof for, format that we're doing. You know, like we're, we're able to make shows within any climate, to be honest with you. Um, and we, we, we've proven that. With the streamers, it's an opportunity to just have some fun and to throw some shit at the wall. I look at Legendary on HBO Max and I'm like, I would have loved to have done that show. Um, you know, Discovery Plus has an, a new streamer now and Nod Today Fiance is kicking everybody's ass. So to be <laughs> able to, to see how these new streamers, they need content. No matter what happens in the world, at the end of the day, the one thing this pandemic has shown everybody is people want to be entertained. People want to escape. You need to have something on the air for people to watch. They can't watch the news all day long. You know, by the time they tuck the kids in bed, they want to have a glass of wine and, and watch real people doing, you know, really crazy things. And my goal in 2021 is to think bigger, is to think outside the box. I want to have more fun with that. Because even when you think about Behind Every Man, that's my way of showing networks that Kingdom Reign, my company, we can do a biographical format that yeah. makes sense for that network. I would love to have a show like The Mass Singer. I want a big broadcast show. Um, I want a dance show, a studio show, a competition show. Those are the things that I'm looking to get into in 2021. That's exciting. And that actually uh, kind of is a good follow up to the last time that you came on the show. And we talked about how as a, an owner of a black company, as a black, black man owning a black company that when you went to, when you pitched, people looked at you in a different way. Oh, well, maybe we need to partner you with another company. Are you seeing any changes? Are people looking at you differently now as you continue to sell, as you continue to produce hits? Are you getting more looks at like, okay, we don't need to put you with anybody else. You can do this. Right. Has there been change even in the six months since we last talked? There has been. A lot of networks have reached out to the company and to me personally when the protest was happening and when it was a call to action for more diversity, not just in front of the camera, but also behind the scenes and really giving Black production companies and just Black businesses a chance, regardless of what industry you're in. So we definitely have received calls just today. Um, I can't say who's Steve, but you'll get this exclusive. Um, just today, a major cable network called and was like, we are really interested in you um, providing some stuff for us. And I was like, you want stuff for me? Um, and it's because a black woman at, a, at, at the, um, the network um, made it happen. She nice. went to her boss and said, we need to start working with him. And she said the same thing you said, Steve. She said, this guy has such a huge presence on social media and he has such a following that what, what I think networks are understanding now is when you buy into a show that I'm producing, 
you're buying into a built-in audience yeah. that's going to follow. Like oh. you said, your brand. Yeah. You developed a brand, uh, uh, Love and Marriage Huntsville. We got another season coming up, right? Yeah, so the new season comes out January 30th at 9 o'clock, 8 central. It's 10 episodes worthy of juicy content. We shot it during, of course, the pandemic, um, but we did it in, in a safe way and it did not taint the season. You know, we were still able to really make some fantastic television. That show is a huge fan favorite for yeah. reality fans and it's, it's growing um, every season because of word of mouth. And that's been the beauty of that show. And that's just the beauty of what we do. I love a grassroots <laughs> operation where it's people calling, like Tiger King. It was like, are you guys watching yeah. this? <laughs> I need somebody to watch this with yeah. me, please. Right. I, love, I need to talk about this. I got to yeah. talk about it. Love and Marriage Huntsville has been that. And I give all the credit to Twitter and to social media and, and word of mouth and people in the hair salons, barbershops talking about this show and it's benefited myself, it's benefited um, the network and their unscripted uh, position in this marketplace. It's nice that OWN is becoming um, a competitor in the unscripted space that I I believe a lot of, a lot of networks are watching the OWN unscripted shows like, why don't we have this? Um, yeah. so I, I'm, I'm happy for them. As somebody who is active and, and having success on social media, do you, are you cognizant about that when you produce or may, maybe even as the show gets closer to air or even in between episodes, are you and your team, are you in touch with the cast in terms of how to use social media to, to increase viewers, to get traction like how do you what do you think in terms of using social media to help the show along social media is the best platform to promote anything on twitter specifically i only follow fans of reality tv <laughs> i need my people i need to know what they're thinking what they what they're what they want what they're desiring i need the feedback of what they're thinking about the show that I'm doing. And I implore all of my new cast members to join Twitter. Live tweeting is a huge deal for the company when a show airs. I am okay with being that person. I have a great staff of people. They're like, that's you. <laughs> like Carlos, <laughs> we've seen 10 iterations of this episode. I'm not watching it live. <laughs> I'm not tweeting with people. So they're like, Carlos, you love it. You enjoy it. Your fans love interacting with you. Have at it. Um, and I get my audience and my cast, I'm sorry, I get my cast on board, like join Twitter, join social media. You got to promote. And then even Bell Collective, we're premiering on Friday. And when they first joined Instagram, they had like maybe 500 followers. They have almost over 5,000 already. And the first episode has haven't aired yet. So no, I'm somebody who believes in using social media for your benefit. And I, I love interacting with my audience on there. Um, the other thing that I always notice on social media, you, you're a very spiritual guy. Yes. Always putting it out there. Amen. Uh, yeah. yeah. Tell me a little bit about you know, is that something that comes from your childhood? Uh, were you always, you know, where I grew up, uh, I grew up a church kid. So I, yeah. I, I know where that comes from. So tell me a little bit about where that comes from. Yeah, I'm born and raised in Detroit, Michigan. Um, faith and spirituality and a belief in God was instituted in me and my siblings since birth. And I've always had this sense of realization that there's a higher power who's guiding my every footstep. And even as like my grandmother would, you know, she's a church, she was a church lady when she was alive. And 
like the church has. She would go to Bible study on Wednesdays, church on Sundays, and church was her life. And I was able to be introduced to God by her. And I've always just had that faith and that belief. And I know that my success is only because of my faith. Um, in, in addition to obviously me working hard and all that stuff, but it, it starts with my faith because you know this business, it, it can drive you crazy. Yes. And that's why a lot of people like yoga. <laughs> that's, that's me. That's my thing. Yeah. I'm <laughs> yeah. a yoga guy. Yeah. Like yoga. I like to go to the gym too. Um, you need an outlet. And my outlet has always been uh, my faith and it gives me purpose and you know, you know, Steve, how networks can be or reality stars can be or producers can be. And one thing I always tell myself is, God, if you brought it to me, you're going to see me through it. So I have now come to grips with giving it all to him. And that's the only reason I'm able to do my job because Listen, it is hard to be the face of something. If you're, well, I'll say this much. You can be the face of something and not put in the work and that's easy. But when you're the face of something and you have to put in the work and you have to oversee your team and you have to talk to the networks because when a network is buying one of my shows, they're buying into me. So I don't have the luxury of skipping a meeting or a network call. But well, like, did Carl just sell us a show and he abandoned us and went to, where is he? <laughs> Again, others, and, and Steve, and you can vouch for this, but yeah. I don't think people understand this. Other CEOs of production companies, they really don't. <laughs> no, no, it, it's, it's very true. For, and I don't want to sound like an asshole, but. No, no you you're, know, you're, you are 100% correct that you are still in that stage of your career. You are hands-on. Uh, from in the field and in the post-production, you're, you're still, most CEOs or presidents of their companies are now in that stage, the Craig Pelligians of the world, the Arthur Smiths of the world. They're very much in the, you know, sales. Sales, 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 sell. Yeah. And, and that's really, you know, maybe they pop into the field, you know, occasionally to make sure the talent is happy, but itself is really the the name of the game for a lot of these a, a lot of the president ceo type people so yeah so I, I i need my faith to keep me going <laughs> so i won't lose my shit. at some point right you're gonna have to as growth happens you're gonna have to start to hand things off when do you know at that moment where it's like okay carlos king cannot do everything how, how did, when, when is that moment? How do you decide? Well, no, what's interesting is that moment is actually now in terms of, I have a great team of leaders in executive positions at my company. And they really do take on the bulk of like the work that I don't need to be a part of. Again, I, I think what a lot of people don't appreciate is their in-house executives. Like to really take on some of the calls with the talent or all of the calls with the talent, you know, that time definitely is now. I enjoy looking at cuts because I love what I do. Yeah. Um, I, I, my, my idol in this business is Tyler Perry because even at, this stage in the game, he still gets a kick out of like directing and writing and producing his own work when he doesn't have to, right? <laughs> but he also knows he's a brand and a name. Yeah. And I, I don't ever want to not be in the mix of it, but the smart thing that I'm doing is compartmentalizing things. Like you handle this, because I, like you said, I can't handle everything. I have a great team of people around me who are taking on so much and they're doing amazing work and they are super involved in the shows and super involved in making the show that, you know, although it's still a little crazy and I still may, you know, go to bed late, I know that it would be crazier 
if I did not have them by my side. So as the company continues to grow, more people would hire, will be hired to take on some of that additional work. You know, like you said, OWN is having success. TLC is having success. You do see HG having success. Mm -hmm. Like I wait for the day when Bravo and E, you know, finally make the decision to come together, specifically now that the Kardashians are gone. Yeah. Do you see any big mergers or anything happening in 2021 that, that like, you're like, okay, this has been bound to happen. When I had Archie Gibbs on, he was like, I'm waiting for the day when Apple buys Netflix. Like, do you see, (laughs) you know, like anything big happening? I mean, even just Quibi, you know, selling all their content to Roku, it feels like we're in that day and age where like, Anything can happen, right? Like- Absolutely. No, I think it's what you said. I I do think Bravo and Eve emerge. I, I do see that 100%. I, I think the biggest surprise, if I had to make a prediction, is I think BET is going to come and reintroduce themselves in a very big way this year. Um, there's a woman named Tiffany Williams, who is um, overseeing the programming and development of the network. And she is super smart and super brilliant. And I think, because a lot of people, again, I'm on Twitter and I read, a lot of people have a lot of smack to say about that network, that I think they're going to come out with some new programming that's going to shock the out of people. And I think that's going to be a surprise because they're a sleeper right now. They're not on the, they're not on anyone's radar in terms of like, you know, unscripted stuff, right? Outside of like their staple Sunday best and yeah. That's you know, a good, that's that's a good point. Shows. They haven't had like a big hit in a while. No, every network has a show that defines their network for Bravo Housewives, for own it was Iyana Fix My Life in terms of unscripted. Yeah. For E Kardashians, for VH1 Love and Hip Hop. -hop. TLC has everything in the world, but (laughs) 90 Day Fiance is the one that's really like- Right now it's 90 Day Fiance, but if you have more than like eight kids, you're good to go. Like- Yes, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. yeah. So I think BET is on its way there. So I, I, w- I will tell people, don't sleep on BET. Yeah. I did way back in the day, like this shows my age. I did, I worked on the original College Hill. I, yes, I did. <laughs> yes. I used to love that show. Yeah, it's, coming, so it's coming back, I think, right? Yes. So that's what I was going to say is yes. Tiff- I mean, again, I, those are rumors, but I believe, yes, Tiffany is bringing college Hill okay. back, which makes sense well, yes i mean college hill was a great show and when i heard that they are bringing it back that that is um i i i knew she's on the right track like, yeah no I, i'm looking forward to seeing that i i love that show yeah it was so good um all right i always like to end with just like uh, what you're watching obviously want everybody to watch bell collective and love and marriage Huntsville, is there anything that you're watching right now or that you've seen recently that, okay, talk to me. I, for the first time, am watching The Bachelor. No one told me The Bachelor is really a female ensemble show. Okay. It's all about the cat fights with the women. It has nothing to do with The Bachelor. Am I telling you something you don't know, Steve? I have... I'm watching, listen, I'll be honest with you. I'm watching it because obviously it's a Black Bachelor. And I said, well, let me watch it, give it a chance. And plus my, I'm older now too in this business. I want to explore other genres. Yeah, sure. I watch it and I'm like, this is a female ensemble show. And these women are like cat fighting and they're competing against each other. And it's more about that and it's less about the romance. So I'm loving The Bachelor. This is so funny. I love Dancing with the Stars. <laughs> I don't know who I've become, Steve. <laughs> Tyra Banks, I love you. Thank you for reintroducing me to Dance with the Stars. RuPaul's Drag Race, I'm watching. The pandemic has opened up my eyes to watching different stuff. Oh, Potomac Housewives had one of the greatest seasons. So did Beverly Hills Housewives. All right. Thank you so much, man. I know you're busy. And um, so dude, before before we go, okay, when is Bell Collective on so that everybody watches it? 
Bell Collector, Friday night, 10 o'clock, 9 central on the Oprah Winfrey Network. Love and Marriage Huntsville returns Saturday, January 30th, 9 o'clock, 8 central. Behind Every Man Follows, Love and Marriage Huntsville, Saturdays, 10, 9 central. And there's a couple of other stuff we have cooking. So um, looking forward for you all watching that. But Bell Collective, my new show, Fridays, 10, 9 central, Oprah Winfrey Network. Carlos, thanks, buddy. I really appreciate the time. Thank you, and, Steve. This um, was fun. Yeah. All right, man. Talk to you soon. See you, brother. Now, for everybody listening, if you enjoy the show, and I hope you do, please subscribe, download, and rate it with five stars. It is available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, Stitcher, Luminary, and TuneIn. You can also find the show at Believe.com and at Believe Podcast. You can follow me on Twitter at Steve Berkowitz and on Instagram at Steve M. Berkowitz. You can write a question if you have one, and I'll answer it on the show. Email those questions to no script, no problem podcast at gmail.com. If you're interested in advertising on the show, please contact Believe at Believe.com. Thanks, everybody, for listening, and thank you again to Carlos King. Until next time, I'm Steve Berkowitz for No Script, No Problem.